Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. Today I have a known review of my new soldering station. It's, uh, I'm probably misspelling it, it's, it's an Action or Action T3A and it's a T245 cartridge based soldering iron. Why am I calling it a known review? Well, there's plenty of reviews online. A good one I can point you to is the one from SDG Electronics. But what I can find online is plenty of reviews which compare this station to similar ones, whether it's the 245 or the T12, which are similar, they're still cartridge-based uh, soldering irons. The thing is, my soldering iron uh, is a Hakko knockoff, I think. It's a AOUE, if I'm saying that right. It's a INT 701A++. I've been having it for many years. I'm definitely not recommending it to you, but that's the one I've been using. My previous iron is this Ursa. And this is not temperature controlled, it's a, it's a very good brand, but it's not temperature controlled. And that's why I upgraded to the Aoyui, which also comes with a desoldering gun, which is working reasonably well, so you know, I'm okay with that. Now, when the Aoyui arrived, I tested it, that was like 10 years ago, more than that. And I was so disappointed that it was actually not performing as well as the Ursa. And then I looked online, other people were uh, reporting the problem, and uh, I read that this is basically a uh, Hakko knockoff. And as a Hakko knockoff, it can fit Hakko soldering tips. Now, as you can see, this station, the Aoyui one, came with a variety of tips, and some of them, basically all of them, are still sealed, brand new, never used in the bag. And what I did, I just purchased a brand new genuine Hakko soldering tip from the UK distributor, so I knew it was not uh, a knockoff. And the soldering station performance changed from night to day. And since then, I've only been purchasing Hakko tips and it's always been working pretty well to me. So what I want to do today is, well, I'm going to, uh, we're going to open it together. I think I might need to do a firmware upgrade, see how it works, you know, without wasting too much time into how it works or whatever, showing all the menus and everything. And for that one, just have a look at SDG Electronics review, which is pretty good. But what I'd like to give you by the end of this video is my feedback on uh, how well this station performs compared to my traditional you know, non cartridge hack or knockoff soldering station. And just that it's clear this is not a sponsored video. I purchased this myself with my own money. So my review is going to be 100% impartial. So, enough me talking. Let's get to opening the soldering station. So this is the soldering station, this is the cradle, power connector, we got the handle and also within the handle we have some um, sleeves uh, which I didn't know they were coming with this. If you watch SDG's electronics review uh, he said that this is getting a bit on the warm side so I purchased some sleeves but it comes with two which is great and this unit comes with three T245 tips. So we'll take a look in a minute. Now, and uh, because of what I said before with my Aoyui, where I was really disappointed by the quality of their tips, I ended up purchasing a JBC Genuine 245 tip. This comes from uh, Kaiser Tech UK, which is the official JBC distributor, so I know this is genuine, and that was like £23. <laughs> so, so it's pretty expensive, but I didn't want to just test with this, because I understand that this can be kind of average quality. I just wanted a good high quality JBC one to make a comparison. And the tip I purchased, I have the same size for my traditional soldering station, so we can do a fair comparison. Okay, well I'm pretty impressed by the packaging here, so you see this is rubber. Uh, it, it feels very professional. Uh, the tip is okay, well obviously I can't really judge the tip from, from the weight, but you know, let's begin with this, which is a knife tip. Now, for those of you who don't know about it, the beauty of the cartridge soldering tip is that the heating element is inside the cartridge itself. Now, if we take a look at my traditional soldering station, as you can see, there is a heating element inside. I slide a soldering tip on top, and then I basically fix it to the handle this way. Now, this can be as good as possible, but there's always be a little bit of thermal inefficiency when the heat is gonna be transferred between the uh, heating element and the tip itself. With a cartridge soldering tip, the heating element is inside the tip. So apparently that's gonna be much more efficient than the tradi traditional station. Okay, I'm ready to power up for my first time. So finger crossed, three, two, one, go. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, well, as I said, this is a known review, so, you know, I don't want to go through the, the menus and everything for that. Again, SDG Electronics. A couple of things I need to do. I need to change the language from Chinese to English. So let's give it a go. Three, two, one, go. It says about four seconds, which is very impressive. Yeah, it's definitely working. Okay. And if I put this back, it's going to sleep at a predetermined temperature, which can be set into the, uh, into the menus. Now, if I understand correctly, this thing can be updated as the firmware can be updated. This is currently version 1.34. So I would say, let's find out how to upgrade it, upgrade it to the latest firmware. And then I guess I'll play with the station and my station for a little while, just to give an, uh, have an idea of, uh, you know, what works, what doesn't, what I like and what I don't. And then I'll pass this feedback to you. And it looks like the station is already at the latest version, it's version 1.34, and um, if I want, I could downgrade it if I wanted, but there's no need to upgrade, which is great. So now it's time for me to play with the station, get the grip of it, understand what I like and what I don't, and then I'll come back to you with my feedback. And here we are back after more than a month. I thought it would take me a few days just to test this unit. And given all the positive reviews I've uh, seen online, I thought it was just a matter of confirming it was a good machine and compare it to my traditional soldering iron. I was not expecting to run into some, what I think are serious issues with this machine. And apparently after extensively looking into that, involving the community, involving iShun, it turns out it's not just my unit. It's uh, what I would call a design flow, but we'll get to that in a minute. I would say let's begin with what I like of this machine and then we'll move to what I don't like about this machine. So as a starting point, I love the solder station <laughs> and I know this might be not very consistent with the thumbnail or the title of this video, but we'll get to that in a minute. I have used this station for some uh, extensive soldering work, including some uh, something for work, and I really like it. There are like a few points that I really think this machine is shining and uh, I'd like to explore them with you one by one. The first point, which is really not a massive game changer, it really depends on how much you use the station, is how fast is the thing to get up to temperature. Now, this iron takes about five seconds to get from cold to full uh, the set temperature, while my traditional uh, soldering station takes about, I think, 30, 40 seconds. I haven't measured it yet. We'll check in a minute. Is that a game changer, as I said? No, but it's nice to know that whenever you grab the handle, whatever status the station is, and you can set up all the delays and the, the temperature, the standby, you can disable the standby if you really need it, but it's gonna take about five seconds. You can literally count to five and start soldering. Five seconds, it's all you need. So as you can see, the soldering iron has reached room temperature and it's fitting a JBC tip, a genuine one, both here in the UK from the official distributor. And uh, the tip is exactly the same size and shape of uh, the one of my traditional soldering iron. So the review, the comparison can be fair for both irons. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna remove the handle from the cradle, put it under my microscope and uh, melt some solder. And then I'll do the same with my traditional soldering iron. And then we'll compare, I'll do a post-production side by side and we can see the difference between the two. Okay, I'm ready to start in three, two, one, go. That's it, done. I don't know how many seconds it took, but we'll check in post-production, it's re literally just a few seconds. So as you can see, it's not the end of the world. I just wanted to mention this. I find the fact that you have only to wait a few seconds a good thing, but definitely not a game changer, unless you're using the soldering iron all the time on a regular basis. Now, some PCBs this soldering station won't have any problem soldering on are these PCBs from PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. If you need a PCB manufactured for one of your products, I definitely recommend PCBWay. 
I've used the services in the past, as you can see, and I was always impressed by the manufacturing quality of the products. And don't forget the PCB Way also offers 3D printing, metal sheet fabrication and much more, so it's a great help for all your projects. You can take a look on pcbway.com, the link is also down below in the description. Let me thank PCBWay for sponsoring my videos, it's really a massive help and it makes these videos possible. So thank you very much PCBWay and uh, now let's go back to the review of the station. The second thing I really like about the iShin soldering iron or the cartridge-based soldering irons is how quickly you can change the tip. Now, with the traditional iron, the uh, uh, interchangeable tip is something that basically goes on top of the heating element, while with the cartridge-based uh, soldering irons, you remove the whole thing. You end up with these tips costing more money, usually, but the thing is, it's going to be easier to replace them because these are cartridges. They just slot them in and they work, take them out, and they just put another one in. Over the years, I found myself using the wrong soldering tip more and more often, unless I really have a long session where I need the bigger one or the smaller one, then at that point, I'll just do that. So let's imagine for a moment I need to replace this soldering tip with this one, okay? So I usually use my pliers. I know maybe it's not the fastest way, so feel free to comment and say, oh, this is actually the fastest way. First thing I have to do, I have to turn off the soldering station. Then I'll have to undo this bit here. Remove the collar. Make sure it goes somewhere where it doesn't burn. This is a silicon mat, so that's fine. Remove the tip. Be careful. Uh, this is, uh, oh, there you go. It's rolling everywhere. This is a ceramic heating element, and I can tell you it's very fragile. On uh, on this very video, at some point, I was swapping this thing, and I forgot to put this back, and I put the collar back in, and it cracked the heating element. Uh, this is a brand new handle because of that reason. So then I can install the replacement tip and put the collar back in. Now you can turn it back on. Wait about 30 seconds, and you're done. Maybe it's me just lazy, I just don't do that on a regular basis. I only do it when I really need that soldering tip. Now let's try and do the same thing with the iShun or again, any cartridge-based soldering station. Now uh, the station is running, it's in standby, but the moment I remove it from the cradle, it's starting now. This is my chisel, two millimeter, and here in the, uh, in the cradle, you know, I have a little holder and let's say I wanna use this um, knife tip. The only thing is you have to make sure it's facing this way, so with the contacts facing towards you. And all you have to do is this. Remove the old one, put the new one in, stick it back in. Done, five seconds, and this is ready to go. And this is, in my opinion, this is just amazing. You wanna go back to the old one? Remove the old one, put the new in, stick it in. Five seconds, and this is good to go. And I really love this. I just found myself, oh, it only takes five seconds to uh, exchange the tip, so I can actually try the smaller one or the bigger one or the different shape. And if it still doesn't work, oh, okay, I can try another one. I found myself buying some extra tips because I found that I'm using them very often. While with the traditional soldering iron, I have a selection of tips, pretty quite a few. I've been having the soldering iron for a few years, but I'm only using them when I really need them. Now, another thing I like about the station is the handle. It's very light, it's, it's very small, and uh, I really like that I'm holding the uh, handle and the tip is just a few centimeters away from my hand, while with the traditional soldering station, you end up with this thing which is much bigger, and most importantly, you're going to do the soldering, I don't know, it's about 10 centimeters away, you can see the difference in distance, and I really feel that this is quite an important thing. If you're doing quite a lot of soldering, this is so much nicer and more comfortable to use than the traditional one. The next thing I really like about the iShun is the power. And this is not just the station, it's obviously a feature of cartridge-based soldering station. Now, to demonstrate this, I have two tests I'd like to do with you. 
Now the first test is the coin test and I'm definitely borrowing this from SDG Electronics. Thank you Steve for all your amazing reviews. This is a two pence coin and I've polished it off to try and remove all the oxidation from it and I've spread some flux on it because I want the oxidation removed from the equation as much as possible. I have two strips of uh, the same type of solder which is my favorite one and the soldering stations are set to the same temperature which is 360 degrees. And by the way, I did purchase a thermometer, so I've calibrated both stations so that with these tips, the temperature is consistent. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to melt these 10 centimeters of solder on the coin, and then I'll do the same with the traditional station, and then I'll, uh, in post-production, I'll put the videos side by side so we can see the difference between the two. My ashing tip should be at temperature, so let's try this. It's impressive, isn't it? Uh, that being said, I don't think anybody's buying soldering station to solder coins. So I'd like to do a similar test on an actual board. This is an Xbox 360 motherboard. I've been using it for testing, so it's, it's not working. And uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like to try and flow a very big solder joint, which is connected to a big inductor. Let me show you. These are the inductors I'm talking about. I think they are the power delivery for the CPU. And here at the back, you can see the solder joints. As you can see, you've got lots and lots of wires or vias indicating that there are several layers joined together. So that should make soldering them or flowing them much complex because it means that the heat is being sucked away from several layers of the boards, possibly ground planes or power planes. So I'm gonna start with the Aishun at 360 degrees. I know that you might wanna use a higher temperature for these things on this type of boards with uh, lead-free solder, but this is just uh, a comparison. I feel that with a lower temperature, I can uh, highlight the difference between the two stations uh, much better. I'm gonna add some of my leaded solder to help the process with both stations. Uh, that should facilitate a bit the process because I suppose that those joints are a bit oxidated or dirty. Um, so again, I don't want oxidation to be in the way. It will definitely be a bit, but I'll try to minimize that. As you can see, both irons can do the job. It's just the uh, cartridge-based iron. 
it's so much better. And again, I've been using it extensively over the past uh, month and a half, and it's lovely. It can do a small job with the small tips, but when you need power, when you need something like this, you can crank up the temperature a bit and it doesn't have any issues. It makes things so much easier, especially on this type of uh, solder joints. So it looks like I'm really happy with this station, and I really am. So why the title of this video? Why the thumbnail? Well, I think it's a combination of the firmware being used and some design flaws, which in my opinion are pretty severe. Let's get to them. Now it all started when I purchased this thermometer. I went to calibrate my JBC tip and I realized that the tip was not able to keep a steady temperature. It was jumping all over the place. More in particular, I noticed that the station is trying to keep the temperature stable, but the temperature is actually slowly decreasing until at some point the station decides to burst like a one second of 90% of power to the uh, tip. The tip goes over 400 degrees with the 360 degree set point and, and then it slowly goes back to the set point. But that's uncalibratable. You know, how can I calibrate something which is jumping like 40 degrees all the time? So I went back to iShoon and I reported the problem. They blamed the JBC tip, of course, but then I understood from the community that that was a known issue with firmware 1.34. And that is the reason why all the tests I've done so far were on 1.33. I found 1.33 much more stable than 1.34 and I couldn't experience temperature variation issues. All my tips are perfectly stable with 1.33. Now, what happened today is I updated back to 1.34 just to shoot this video and show you what the problem is with the latest firmware. And, um, and I can't replicate the problem anymore. Let me show you, it's still there but I feel something happened to that firmware and it's not the same I've downloaded a few weeks ago. I got the station set to 360 degree and let's see what we get here. I'm getting something very close to 360, which is very good. If you take a look at the power measurement here, the temperature is now going down and at some point it should spike. Not doing anything here. There you go, it spikes. That still reads 360, but now my, temp my thermometer is reading 370. And that's exactly what I wanted to show you. So the station is trying to fool us to th think that the temperature is actually 360, but it's not. And this happens, I feel it happened, well, I feel I have video evidence. <laughs> it used to happen like regularly every like 10, 15 seconds. Now it seems to be happening when uh, there is some... Um, temperature change. Like in this case, I used the sponge, the temperature went down, the station is unable to maintain the temperature properly, temperature is going down and then it spikes. And again, we are talking about, what's that, 40 degrees delta between the set temperature, the lowest that it reaches and the highest that it reaches. And this to me, it's unacceptable. It, it, it can't be like 40 degrees. I'm expecting a few degrees, not 40. And most importantly, the station is lying to me. It's telling 360 all the time, but clearly it's not. I've tested on 1.33 and this does not happen with 1.33. And that's the reason why I showed you the beginning of this video with 1.33. So this to me is a pretty severe problem. Uh, can that be addressed by firmware? It will look so because 1.33 is working, but that's not the main issue I've discovered with this station. Let me show you what I found. Here on the bench, I have a random PCB. It's a CRT neck board, nothing special. It's just something that I found it can replicate the problem I'm about to show you. Now the station is set to 360 degrees and if I'm reflowing these uh, big joints here one by one, you can see that you know the power delivery to the tip is between zero and, I don't know, 10%. Every now and then you see a spike, which is exactly what we noticed before. Again, the, the station is somehow unable to keep a reasonable temperature, the set temperature, without making these spikes. But that's not the problem I'd like to show you. For now, this is kind of normal behavior. And if I'm checking the temperature again, uh, I don't have solder, but yeah, we are 350, 60, that's kind of okay. 
What I'm going to do now, I'm going to get these ground clip and ground the board. And I'll get to that in a minute, why you want to ground the board. It's a very real world situation. But for now, let's acknowledge that I'm grounding the board. The station is again set to 360 and let's see what happens when I touch, especially the first pin here. I'm touching the pin, keep an eye on the power delivery of the station. There you go, you went to 100%. Every time I'm touching this, it goes to 100%. Okay, now if I'm checking the temperature now, this thing is at 440 degrees. That's 80 degrees higher than the set temperature. And every time I'm touching the spin, you can see this massive spike in there, okay? But the display is not reflecting that. But if I'm checking with a the thermometer, 440 degrees. And that's scary. I don't want 440 degrees on my PCB, especially if the station is not telling me that that's happening. I've been discussing this with some online communities. The most useful was definitely EV Blog of uh, EV Blog uh, channel from Dave Jones in Australia. Thank you guys for your help. And what I think I understand is that when the board is grounded and there's a ground plane or some ground on the board, that interferes with the ability of the circuitry to read the thermocouple reading inside these cartridges. Now, JBC obviously managed to sort it out with some electronic wizardy, whatever happens. This station apparently is not very good at doing that. Now, if you switch back to 1.33, what happens is that the display will actually display intermittently no tool, no tool, no tool, and it will still spike to stupid temperatures. 1.34 doesn't show that error anymore, but it's still spiking. But as you can see, the display is not reflecting that spike, which I feel is not great. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would you need to do soldering on uh, something which is grounded? Got lots of people telling me, well, that's normal. You should remove any cables from anything you're soldering, blah, blah, blah. Yes and no. I'm telling you how I discovered this. I was uh, soldering a nicer slot on a motherboard, which was on a preheating board. Now, the preheating board is grounded. The motherboard was naturally touching the stands of the preheating board, so I was grounding the motherboard, not intentionally, it's just the, the preheating board is grounded itself. And when I realized that, I was on 1.33, it was telling me no tools, and I thought it was a problem with my tip. I tried with the other ones, and it was happening exactly the same thing. Surprisingly, it only happens on some pins. I can think of another couple of situations where I encountered the same problem. Number one, I'm uh, probing something with my oscilloscope. I have my ground clip connected to uh, a chassis or something or the board itself. And then I want to remove a component or do uh, a touch with my soldering iron. And the ground clip is still connected to the board. And that will trigger the problem. Yes, I can try and remember every time to remove my ground lead from the device under test, but that's really not expectable. Another real world situation, I had a signal generator going into, I think it was a sound device, and I started doing some soldering and I experienced a problem and I realized, oh, I've got the uh, signal generator still plugged in, which is grounded and I had to unplug it. Another real world scenario is removing SMD capacitors. I recently had to remove quite a few SMD capacitors from a board, so I decided to use two soldering irons. It's, it's much easier than use one. And one one is the Aishun, the other one is my traditional soldering iron, which is grounded. So I've noticed that on some capacitors, not all of them, whenever I was trying to remove them, the uh, power delivery bar was spiking on and off all the time, the temperature was going crazy, and the display, most importantly, was not reflecting that. That is unavoidable. The other soldering iron is grounded. Even this one is grounded, but somehow it doesn't like when something else is grounded on the PCB. So clearly this is completely unacceptable, at least from my point of view. Now, before publishing this review, I did get in touch with Aishun and uh, it's taken about a month of back and forth emails where 
well, it wasn't really back and forth, <laughs> about the month of emails from my end asking for updates. I was asked to contact the iTunes technical support. I never got reply from them. I also contacted the AliExpress reseller, which is an official distributor of these machines. They confirmed that this is a genuine iTunes machine. I never got an answer. The last answer I got from the um, like worldwide marketing manager was that the team is looking into that and they will let me know when there is an update. It's been a month, I just wanted to release this, this uh, review. I really cannot accept this behavior and I wanted you know, the internet to know that this is happening. Whether this is gonna be mitigated with a new software, I do not know. Now I've gone back to 1.33 to show you the difference and I'm back to my JBC tip. And I don't know what it reads, it might have lost the calibration, but um, whatever it reads, which is 340 something, it's gonna be pretty, pretty stable in my experience. It won't change, it won't jump over time. It will more or less stay on that temperature all the time. If I'm using the sponge, obviously it go down a little bit in temperature, but then it should go back to 344. And if, if I try again with the sponge, it never spikes, it never does anything weird as it was doing before. And this is definitely what other reviewers have experienced. Now, if I'm going back to my grounded CRT neckboard, there is a major improvement with 1.33. And uh, when I'm touching these joints, you can see that it overshoots, but it's actually recording the overshoot on the display, which I feel is much, you know, I'd rather know that it's overshooting than the display to stay you know, stuck on 360 degrees when it's not 360 degrees. So to me, it looks like 1.34, they hide this problem by preventing the display from showing this massive, massive overshoot that you're seeing right now. I have one final quality issue I'd like to report and that uh, in this like month of usage of this uh, handle, this happened, the top part of the handle just detached I think this is only glued. It came off completely. I think it might have been me trying, you know, I think I was trying to push some leads away on a board, uh, but I don't, I don't think this should happen. So, you know, I'll apply some glue. It's not the end of the world. It's, uh, it's another little thing that you might not expect from uh, your soldering iron. Oh, and finally, just a quick mention of the buzzing that many people are reporting. I've noticed that my station, my handle are buzzing. It's just, it really depends on the situation. It depends, it depends on many things, including the firmware, because 133 is buzzing differently than 1.34. Uh, let me see if I can show you. Finally, let's go back to the original purpose of this video. How does the Aishin or a 245 soldering station compares to my traditional soldering iron? Is it worth updating? Is it better on anything? Are there any drawbacks? And I would say the Aishin or the 245 station is definitely a very big update on a traditional soldering iron like mine. If we ignore for the moment those issues I've been mentioning to you, it outperforms my hack or knockoff on every single aspect. Does that mean that if you have a traditional soldering station, you must update to a cartridge-based type of soldering station and this uh, traditional soldering iron is completely useless? No, absolutely not. A traditional soldering iron, especially a good quality one, this is still, I think it's a 70 watt soldering iron. And uh, as I said, it features genuine hacko tips. It's perfectly capable of doing, I would say 90% that I can do with the uh, Aishin. Actually, I can do 100%, it's just some of the tasks tasks are not going to be as efficient as with the uh, cartridge-based station. And that's a final consideration, do I personally recommend the Aishin T3A soldering station? Well, it's not an easy decision. As I said, I do love this station, but it comes with pretty important drawbacks. 
There is an important aspect to be kept into consideration, and that's the price of the station. If I remember right, this station is about £140, and if I'm not mistaken, and if I am, please do leave a comment down below and correct me, the next 245 station available is going to be like a JBC or a similar brand, which are going for around £500. So we're talking about £350 more money to get to something better than this. With that in mind, this is a very capable station. It comes with some serious drawbacks, but it also sells for a very low price. So uh, I would leave that decision to you. If you are happy to deal with those design flows, then I really like the station and I can definitely recommend it to you, but you have to understand the design flows it comes with. I hope that Aishin can come up with a better firmware and can hopefully mitigate these, uh, these issues. For now, I'm kind of happy with my purchase and I guess this is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it and if you did, as usual, I'd appreciate a thumb up down below and also consider subscribing to this channel if you like this kind of things. If you want to leave a comment, I read them all and I try to reply to them all. For now, I wish you a great day, I thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon here on my channel for my next videos. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye bye.